Welcome everyone. We'll give folks just a moment or two to log on and then we'll get started. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in which we strive to bring you the authors we all love to our Politics and Prose community. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Plunder, Napoleon's Theft of Veronese's Feast on the Politics and Prose website. You can ask a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, just click on the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen. Finally, thank you again for being with us here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. In addition to plunder, Napoleon's theft of Veronese's feast, Cynthia Saltzman is the author of Portrait of Dr. Gachet, the story of a Van Gogh masterpiece, and Old Masters, New World, America's Raid on Europe's Great Pictures. A former reporter for Forbes and the Wall Street Journal, she is the recipient of a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation and has degrees in art history from Harvard and the University of California, Berkeley. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. She'll be in conversation with Blake Gopnik, who is one of North America's leading art writers. He served as an art and design critic at Newsweek and as chief art critic at the Washington Post, and Canada's Globe and Mail. He has a PhD in art history from Oxford University and is a regular contributor to the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming them both to PMP Live. Thank you, Chelsea. What a, what a treat to, to sort of be in Washington again after many years away, but many years living there. And I think Cynthia has a Washington connection as well. Let me just say what a tremendous pleasure it was to read, to read Plunder fascinating book uh, with lots of unusual elements in it and an unusual structure that we'll be talking about in a minute. But I think we're going to get a little introduction to it from Cynthia. Um, first, a little a little um, screen sharing so we can get a sense of what she's talking about in the book and we'll look at some pictures. So we'll do that for a few minutes and then Cynthia and I will we'll talk through what the book is all about and why it's so fascinating. Thank you, Blake. And thank you everyone for coming. Yes, I'd, I'd like to show you Veronese's wedding feast and some other pictures just to set the scene of the book. So here it is, the wedding feast at Cana. This is a huge and absolutely beautiful canvas, 33 feet wide, 22 feet tall, painted in 1563 by the Venetian artist Paolo Veronese to cover the entire end wall of the refectory of the monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. Now, San Giorgio Maggiore was a rich and powerful Benedictine monastery that stood on an island across from the Doge's palace. And in 1797, the French tore this canvas down from the wall of the monastery. They rolled it up, they packed it into a crate, they loaded it onto a ship, and they had it transported to France. And four years later, it went up at the Louvre. Now, when in 1797, the French seized the Sparanese, Napoleon was leading his very first campaign in Italy. He was only 26. He was fighting the Austrians who for over a century had occupied the Duchy of Milan. And this portrait was painted by the French artist Antoine Gros, himself only 25, when Napoleon was on this very first campaign. As Napoleon swept across Northern Italy, he forced his enemies to hand over paintings and sculpture. And he reached Venice in May, 1797, and he demanded the Venetians surrender 20 paintings. And one of these was Veronese's wedding feast at Cana. Now the subject of this picture, 
In the 16th century, it had become the custom in Northern Italy for monasteries to decorate their refectories, their dining halls, with paintings of a New Testament supper. And the most famous of these is in Milan, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. The Wedding Feast of Cana is another biblical supper, but completely different because it is the most festive of biblical feasts. And Jesus attends a wedding, and in the course of the celebration, the host runs out of wine, and Jesus is alerted to this, and then he miraculously turns water into wine. And this is his first miracle. And what's wonderful is that Veronese sets this biblical supper in his own 16th century Venice. There are over 130 figures, many of them life-sized, and he dresses these figures in the silks and other fabrics for which Venice was famous. And he puts the feast on a terrace, above it is another terrace, and then he sets the whole scene in this beautiful stone soaring Renaissance architecture. And it's really a portrait of Venetian society, a portrait of Venice. And he shows his brilliant use of color and his ability to create the illusion of reality. And he captures the moment when certain individuals recognize the miraculous wine. So here is the wine steward in this beautiful brocade with the illusion of light playing over it. And he's looking at the glass and seeing the, the wine. Now, a lot is going on in this picture. The bride and groom are all the way to the left. She's also in white and blue brocade. He's in red and blue and gold. And at the very center is Jesus. And beside him is his mother Mary and various apostles. And above, servants are preparing food and racing back and forth with trays. And below is this group of musicians. And then in front of them, these wonderful dogs, one of whom is looking at a cat. In the 17th century, a critic uh, claimed that the figure in white, the musician who's playing the viola de gamba, was a self-portrait of Veronese. Now this may or may not be true, but what's important is that Veronese has put these musicians center stage, signaling the major place of music in the life of Venice, and more broadly speaking, the central place of art. Now this is San Giorgio Maggiore, much as the French would have seen it when they arrived in 1797. This is a painting by the Venetian view painter, Canaletto. And the white facade is the church of San Giorgio Maggiore, which was designed by the Renaissance architect, Andrea Palladio. And to the right are buildings of the monastery that lead to the refectory. Shortly before Veronese painted the wedding feast, the monastery had commissioned Palladio to redesign the refectory. And today you can really get a sense of what Palladio's refectory looked like when the Veronese was there. In 2007, the Cini Foundation, which owns San Giorgio Maggiore, commissioned a digital image of Veronese's feast to put on the refectory's end wall. So here you see Palladio's beautiful white room with the tall windows and the digital image, which conveys something of the way Veronese's painting, running all the way to the side walls, worked with Palladio's architecture, and also the way Palladio's room literally framed Veronese. And brilliant painter that he was, Veronese created the illusion that the room opens up and that this banquet is taking place on a terrace just outside. But the French had had their eyes on this Veronese since the 17th century. Louis XIV had tried to buy it. And today, the wedding feast of Cana remains in the historic heart of the Louvre. This is a picture I took last year in the Salle des Etats, this room with these beautiful dark blue walls where the Veronese faces the Mona Lisa. Of course, what you don't show is that if you turn around, everyone is looking at the Mona Lisa and no one's looking at the Veronese. It's one of the heartbreaking moments in any art historian's life. This, um, is, this is a true thing, Blake, you're absolutely right. But thank you, Cynthia, that that's just was fabulous. Uh, you know, looking at the pictures, I suddenly realized how incredibly unwarlike the Veronese is. One of the, you know, your book has this amazing balance between Napoleon and Veronese and kind of flips back and forth between the 16th century and the, and the 18th century and 19th century. And I hadn't really thought 
about what a contrast there was between the, the world of the picture and the world of late uh, 18th century Europe as Napoleon is, is plundering and, and battling his way through it. Um, so I really want to ask you, which came first for you, the painter or the emperor? Were you interested in Veronese and then realized his painting had been stolen or were you interested in Napoleon and realized that he did the stealing? Well, I, I like to write about the, tr the tr art and the transfer of art. And I became, uh, really the emperor came first because I, I had the idea when I was writing uh, the book, The Portrait of Dr. Gachet, which told the story of this Van Gogh from the time it was painted in 1890 to the time it sold in 1990. And part of the life of that painting was, it was its involvement with the Nazi regime. And when, well, often when I was reading about Nazi plunder, that Van Gogh was actually, um, the Nazis called it degenerate art. Um, I, when we read about Nazi plunder, they would off, historians would often mention Napoleon because he was the, had set a precedent by plundering European art on that huge scale. Not as huge as the Nazis at all, but still all of Europe or much of Europe. So you got to Napoleon first and then how did, I mean, Napoleon plundered a whole lot of art. How did the Veronese turn out to be the center of the book? How did you decide to have those two poles in the book rather than Napoleon and a hundred other artists? Yes, I, and I, 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 th I thought it was the most important to talk about the art of Italy because this was the art that he plundered first and it was the art that it was most important to the French. Um, that was where people took the grand tour in the 18th century. And then I, I wasn't originally going to focus on the Veronese and then I realized this is the perfect way to do it. I mean, I had, I, it was all facing the Mona Lisa, but um, so that's important because it still remains in the Louvre and most of half about, about half of the works that Napoleon plundered from Italy went back, but it's a fabulous painting. And to me, the, it's theft was emblematic of the whole, Napoleon's whole art plundering project because he wanted masterpieces. It was a masterpiece. And by explaining the significance of the painting, um, I could explain the significance of the loss to Venice and also then the significance, um, its importance to Paris and to the various French artists who were influenced by it. Right, it occurs to me that one of the things about all of the books that you write is about the ways pictures move through the world and the way in which that matters. We tend to think of pictures as these kind of uh, objects divorced from settings. They're just in museums and they kind of float free as cultural signifiers. But it occurs to me the Veronese is especially special because it really needed to be the place. It was meant for a particular place. It means something different in that place. So seeing it in a kind of disembodied state in the Louvre stands, it seems to me, for the importance of understanding the way pictures need to be in places and change their meanings when they move from place to place. Yeah, that's what's so fascinating is the shifting fortunes of the painting and the way people see it differently. This painting, like most Renaissance paintings, um, and, it all, and, all, and almost all the paintings that Napoleon took from Venice was painted as we saw from that specific site. And when they, and when they removed it, not only did they hurt the paint, damage the painting because it's so difficult to get out of that architectural frame, but also, um, as you say, the meaning changes or the way you, it is seen changes. It was no longer an object of religious devotion anymore. Then it goes into a museum and it's in the context of art history. Right, um, and, and it doesn't have a room. You, the, the Mona Lisa is right behind it. There are other paintings in the room. It no longer has that quality of extending the space. It's lost so much of its original meaning and aesthetic, aesthetic meaning as well, it seems to me. I think that's true, but it also, its new context is also fascinating too, just in terms of, because it's, so, it's in, except for the Mona Lisa, the whole room is Venetian paintings. So. If you want to know about Venetian paintings, that's a wonderful place to, to go. And then nearby, um, the way it is in the Louvre, they have uh, the 19th century French or 18th and 19th century French paintings, the Davids, the Delacroix, artists um, and paintings that were directly influenced by this painting. So right. um, it's, it's, an, its new context is very rich too. Of course, absolutely. Um, tell me something. Uh, it's one of the things that surprised me in your book is that 
few people seem to be that surprised at the plunder. It felt almost as though after, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of warfare in Europe, plunder seemed relatively normalized. I mean, it seems that there were complaints by people, but it doesn't sound as though people were utterly shocked that a victor would demand spoils in war. Am I right in feeling that way? That it, it I think it would shock us more today if someone went in after war and demanded spoils. It seems almost as though that was considered a normal part of warfare. Well, it had been the norm for centuries, starting with in, in antiquity. But and in the 17th century, um, Queen Christina, famous, her armies famously plundered Prague. But in the 18th century, um, thanks largely to the Enlightenment, it was no longer the norm. There aren't any major examples of plundering in the 18th century, but the French revived it when, um, and they did it um, driven by the ideology of the revolution. And they first, when they were fighting the Austrians in the Austria Netherlands, they took these fabulous Rubens altarpieces from Antwerp. And they argued that the French Republic was the only worthy place for these great masterpieces. And also the only place that was capable of conserving them. So Napoleon really and the French really started it up again, and I think I think people were um, were quite shocked. They mm -hmm. certainly condemned it when they they or they they come to the Louvre and they are dazzled, but they also say it's a victory monument, right. and um, they they say and people like the German um, playwright Schiller says that the French. Now are incapable now that they've taken this and turned it into plunder are incapable of actually appreciating these masterpieces so and there is a kind of sad irony that the masterpieces uh get get plundered and brought to france in the name of the republic but of course in that very it's the very moment when the republic is dying and, and napoleon is just becoming another autocrat it's it's kind of tragic in fact yes well it, it had a, it had a little time it had a little time before that happened. I mean, right. not, not, a, not surprisingly, not that long a time before Napoleon starts adopting essentially royalist models for his behavior. Yes, creates an aristocracy, and yeah, it's amazing. Um, also, I think he modeled it. I think he modeled his plundering really. I mean, he really learned from the from the French kings, you know, that they had used art and architecture to aggrandize themselves and build their image of political power. And I think. This is exactly what he did. Isn't it interesting that he reverts to a pre-enlightenment model in a sense, almost a medieval model for what it is to, to, to conquer, what it is to, to plunder the conquered nations, that all of those models seem like they're pre-enlightenment, even though he's the great uh, you know, uh, recipient of enlightenment culture in, a, in one sense, at least. I mean, uh, yeah, without the revolution, we wouldn't have gotten very far. Um, it says I am the revolution, but that well, what's so par wonderful paradox is that I mean, he really benefits, I think, from collecting this plunder in Paris. He particularly, and yet he is, in fact, um, he is plundering for the French nation, and the destination is the Louvre, and the Louvre is in an in, in an institution inspired by the Enlightenment, right, open to the public. Its mission is education and conservation. So he really, um, that helps him in a way legitimize the, the plunder. It's a really interesting tension throughout your book that this institution that's for the people, that's anti-royal in a sense, but comes wrapped up in Napoleon's old construction of his own royalty. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, now, one of the things I was struck by in your book is that I think you probably, had you been infinitely lazier than you are, could have written it based on secondary sources, but it's really impressive for someone trained in history as I was, the extent to which you dug into the original sources and not just the original sources, but actual archival sources. In all that digging, tell me what you what was the biggest surprise for you, what was the most exciting thing to discover, what you're most proud of even in the book. For our reader, for our listeners today, tell us uh, if they had to read one thing in the book, one page, what's the thing that you're most proud of? Oh, that's hard. But um, uh, one of the things I loved, I mean, I, I, the primary sources were so much fun to see in the Venetian State Archives to find. And when I went there, I found this list um, that the French had made of the paintings that they want, wanted to take from Venice. And that Napoleon had a commission 
And the head of the commission was this wonderful scientist named Claude Bertolet. And I discovered that he went there just from letters, that he had gone there a month before any of the other commissioners. And so he had really done the list. And there's this, the list on three pages of paper, in French, a beautiful writing, but it's still sort of basically scribble these masterpieces. And it's just amazing to see that this is the way, you know, they went to the Doge's palace, they list five paintings and they cross over to San Giorgio Maggiore and that's number six. So that was quite amazing to see. And then I could follow their route and see how they had done it. They used a guidebook, I think you said even, right? To figure out what it is that they should be looking at? Yes, I mean, nobody actually, I mean, there's no evidence that they, they didn't, they didn't write, this is, we used the guidebook, but it was clear that they did. I mean, and um, because the guy, and the guidebook that they used was written by another scientist named Lalonde, who was the, an astronomer, a famous astronomer in Paris, head of the um, Paris Observatory. And Lalonde singles out um, seven paintings in Venice that are the, the things you absolutely have to see. And the French took six of those. So right. it was quite clear. And he was a friend, must have been a friend of Bertolet's because he was a scientist too. Right. Uh, was the was Titian's great Assunta in the Friary Church on the list? I was surprised they didn't take that. It seems the obvious thing to take. That was the other thing that, that Lalonde mentioned, the one they didn't take. And it was because I think it was literally so big, so big. Yeah, and I think it's on pan a panel, so. Right, it was just going to be too. Although one of the shocking things in your book is how they took the the painting off the wall. Do you want to tell our, our listeners a little bit about that? It just makes your heart weep to, to see what they did to get that Veronese off the wall. Well, the, yeah, it was a, so it was a canvas. So in theory, this is what's another paradox. In, in you know, the Venetians had pioneered the painting of oil on canvas and um, so it's the paintings on canvas, it was enormous. So as I said, in theory, it could be moved and yet it really was never meant to be moved. Um, Veronese never expected it to be moved. So to get it off the wall, they, there were nails around the periphery, attaching it to a stretcher, but also three rows of nails attaching it to, to crossbars on that stretcher. And they pulled these nails out. They had been covered by putty and paint. Um, and when they did that, they made three created three rows of holes all across the front of the painting. So, which is quite a bit of damage. Yeah, yeah I don't think, sorry. When it got to um, France, they were, had to restore the picture and they wanted to line it and put a new lining on the back of the painting and then they damaged it some more because they sliced the painting in two. Imagine slicing the painting in two, it just, well, that makes it sound, I mean, they wanted to line the picture. It was too, too big to yeah. line in right. one piece, they said. And there was, I mean, that was an interesting um, document too. In a memo, they say the painting is too large. We have to line it in two parts, so. Was it always obvious to you that you were going to have to use archival sources? Or did you think, oh, art historians will have done all this for me already. I'll just look and publish, you know, an edition of, of documents and I'll be fine. Or did you know from the beginning, you're gonna have to dig deep in the archives? Well, I hoped I would dig deep because I think that's when you get new things. You know, you really um, come up with something different. You come up with something new. And obviously this uh, Napoleon has been written up about a great deal. Um, this aspect of it hadn't been written about it that much. Even Veronese scholars hadn't really dug into this later history of it? Uh, no, not really. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like what it was like using the Archivio dello Stato in, in Venice? It can be a bit of an adventure, right? Yes. Have you been there? I have. have. Been, yes. It's, it's an amazing place because what it has a thousand years of documents. Um, so it's wonderful because it's very modern. I mean, you, you look at what you look up what you want and they bring it to you. It's, um, that's all very uh, contemporary, but they have these wonderful old boxes, cardboard boxes, and the documents that I was looking at were really literally in stacks that were tied by a cotton ribbon. And so you got the sense um, of really, you know, being closer to the history in a way, because it seemed like these documents have been put there a long time ago, yeah. um, you know, maybe in the late 18th century. And pe uh, some people, people have been looking at them, but they really hadn't been put in a different box or reorganized or anything. 
Yeah, there's nothing like holding a document that, that, that is that old in your hands. It's one of, the tr one of the treats of being a historian, isn't it? And they had a wonderful, um, the other thing that was interesting in these documents was um, the restorer whose name is Pietro Edwards. He, he was a pioneering um, restorer of paintings and his job was, he was really in charge of all the Venetian um, government's paintings, which is a huge number of paintings in the Doge's palace. And he was assigned by the Venetians to help the French pack up these paintings. And he wrote um, a long, long letter describing his in interactions with the French. It's a very moving letter because um, the Venetians didn't resist at all, but in a way he resisted. He said, for instance, he said, this painting is too fragile to take, but they ignored him. Were there any cases where they wanted something and he successfully got them not to take it? Yes, um, there was a huge Tintoretto um, that he was he was working on in his conservation studio, um, uh, uh, The Last Judgment, and um, he told them it's just too fragile because he was literally working on it. I, I thought they were interested in it probably because it was already down, taken down from the wall. They wouldn't right. get blamed for the, the damage they did to that. Um, and then they, the thing is they replaced it with another Veronese feast, an absolutely beautiful second feast. So he probably regretted, I thought, right. saying losing, anything else. losing two feasts. <laughs> um, do, the, do you have any sense whether the, the Venetians still harbor a grudge about that? I mean, they're, they're, one of their great paintings is in the Louvre. Does it come up? Did it come up when you met Venetians when you were there? I have to admit, I haven't heard that mentioned, but I was wondering if there's any hint of that in your work. No, not, not really, except there wasn't one um, a commentator um, who I spoke to, who's written about Venice, and he's been his family's been in Venice for a long, long time, and he was very. Um, he thought it was a painful subject, but the way he talked about it was very in, in terms of Venetian history, because he used he thought of it the painting um, as emblematic of the terrible um, of what Napoleon did and how destructive Napoleon was to Venice. You know, Venice was already but greatly weakened since the 16th century and the 18th century, it was no longer a great mercantile power. And then um, Napoleon really damaged it even more and then gave it to the Austrians. And, but he, he looked, he kept talking about that in historical terms when I talked to him. Now they had tried, um, the San Giorgio Maggiore had tried for the, the, when the Cini Foundation, there's a, the Cini Foundation had taken over San Giorgio Maggiore in the 50s. And the head of the Cheney Foundation apparently spoke, spoke to Andre Malraux about getting it back. And Malraux had said, politically impossible. Um, and yet I thought that what's interesting is in some ways this um, digital reproduction sidesteps the issue of restitution, which is really a, an issue of, for, di for the diplomats. And, yeah, the digital stuff is starting to get awfully interesting the way they can do. I gather it even reproduces some of the surface texture of the original painting that could turn out to be something really important in restoring things to the original context so we can actually see what they looked like when they where they were supposed to be hung. Um, yeah, and it's when you it's a it's an amazing thing. I don't think it's I mean it's not to me the same as the, as the painting. Um, but you do get a sense when you're standing in that room of not only being in that room and the illusionism of, of, the, of, Ver, of what Veronese was doing in the painting, but a sense that you are in Venice and that all around you is this still, because Venice is so, the architecture of Venice is still so similar to the way it was, um, that you, you are in this amazing culture that could only, and only this place could have produced this painting. Yeah, of course, when you showed the Canaletto, you know, it could almost be a photograph today across the Grand Canal to the to the San Giorgio Maggiore. It's kind of amazing the way things haven't changed. It's one of the glories of Venice, of course. Um, now, tell me, Napoleon at this very moment is a complicated figure in French culture, but even I guess you could say in world culture, where he's seen sometimes as some kind of a hero and other times as a, as a real devil. How do you feel about him? And did it change over the course of writing this book, your sense of who Napoleon was, whether he was someone who, who was forward looking or retrograde? What, give, give us your take, your first take and then your last take on Napoleon. 
He was both um, forward looking and, and not. Um, and I, I first, you know, my view of him was quite neg was negative because I started out um, looking at him through plundering and I had a very, you know, have a very negative opinion of that. Um, so I think it became more complicated when I learned about him because he was, um, I mean, I, th I think of the, when I, the plundering really reflects um, certain definitive aspects of his character, his desire for greatness and glory. And I think he understood um, masterpieces as being measures of the culture or civilization, the way he thought of scientific discoveries that way. And yet he was ruthless and the plundering reflects his ruthlessness and his, um, you know, if he's, he, he gets what he wants, no matter what the cost. And that cost often tainted the, the greatness and the glory. And, um, but I think it became, my view of him became more complicated. First of all, he's um, the most amazing person. He was almost as though he was born ahead of his time. He, he does so many things at once and his, the speed at which he did everything, including this racing across Italy, um, shocked and surprised everybody. And I mean, he wrote 2000 letters on the Italian campaign, but um, you, you, it's still, it, I still have my overall view of him is quite negative, but it, I understand why the French are ambivalent about it because there are so many good things. You know, on the one hand, there's the legal code. On the other hand, there's the Russian campaign. Now, of course, when he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because boy, am I not a Napoleon specialist, but he is not in a sense Napoleon when he starts the, the Italian campaign, right? He's just another French general. I mean, he's impressive because he's risen so far so fast, but he's not anything like Napoleon. Is the Italian campaign central in turning him into this, this giant figure? And is the plunder important in that transformation as well? Did he initiate the plunder or were there some forces back in France that, that got that started? How much is this all about Napoleon and how much is it about a group of people? Well, the French had started it in Belgium. So that was the French policy. And yet I think he made it his own policy. I mean, the moment he gets to uh, Italy, only a, a few weeks into the campaign, he writes the French ambassador in Genoa. And he says, send me a list of paintings and sculptures in all the places that he plans to conquer, all the states and he does conquer, Modena, Parma, then the Papal States. Um, and the Italian campaign is crucial to creating the person he was, the commander that he was, but already during the campaign, and, and I think the art plundering is crucial to this, he, um, he starts thinking of himself as a statesman and he's planning ahead. He doesn't, he writes, he negotiates these treaties with the various Italian states, often without checking back with the government in France. He just sets the terms and one of the important terms are, are his ideas to put the works of art into the treaties. Um, that's his idea. And, uh, and I think that shows his, uh, you know, his, his very meticulous, but also he made this very systematic, you know, just the way he had a com the commission to um, choose the works of art. Putting them into the treaties means that later people aren't gonna ask questions. It's, it also shows that he knew it was controversial. So he's really acting almost like a head of state already. He's decided that he's gonna act like a head of state and in a sense become one de facto by virtue of acting that way. Yes, exactly. And I think, um, you know, as I say, the um, collecting these great works of art, even though they were, it was controversial and criticized, it still linked him to these masterpieces and thus, thus put him in a way in the same tradition as, as the French kings. Did he, did he uh, order plunder of other things, scientific instruments? Was there a sense of a larger plundering episode or was it mostly simply the, the works of art? No, there were um, scientific instruments. They also, that's why the commission was made up of, he asked, he asked France to send in a group of artists to pick the works of art. Um, the French government sent two artists, two naturalists, and two of these great scientists, including Berthelet, the greatest scientist in France. And um, I think it's so interesting that um, they did take tech collections of natural history, but they had none of the weight that works of art did and the masterpieces did because they're not unique and they can be re even rare um, specimens can be re reproduced or 
get their, their duplicates. But also I think that it's so interesting that they took put these great scientists at the head of the commission that was really going after the art because um, they knew it was controversial and it would try to sort of legitimize, it would give this plundering commission some weight and credibility with, with the rest of Europe because they were internationally famous. Now, do you have any sense if Napoleon gave a damn about the actual works of art as works of art? Is there any hint of his interest in, in aesthetics or art? I mean, after all, here he is plundering all these masterpieces. Do you think he looked at them or cared even a little bit about them? Uh, that's a good question. He, he dropped the famous names, Leonardo, Michelangelo. Um, I think he, under, he, he understood the power of art because when Antoine Gros paints that portrait of him, that wonderful portrait, which really establishes his image, another important thing about the Italian campaign, he immediately um, asks, he gives Gros money and he asks him to have a print made so he can disseminate that image. But um, in, in terms of aesthetics, he was no connoisseur, no aesthete. And it's interesting that two the works of art, the only works of art he specifically asks for when, you know, in this plundering operation are two busts of Brutus. So they're really political figures, you know, and it's, I think the meaning of art really for him was mostly political. It is worth mentioning, as you mentioned in the book, that it's not just Renaissance art, they're plundering all of the great Roman antiquities from, from Rome which is just as scary at least. But of course, we also tend not to uh, conflate the two categories as I think they did in the 18th century. That is, it, you, could, you could like Roman art just as much as you liked Renaissance art. And the two things had started to, to collapse as categories, I think. Yeah, and, they, and the, when one of the fascinating things was the most important thing that the French wanted were these antiquities in Rome. Because in the 18th century, they, I mean, there were very hierarchical view of art and they were considered the absolutely the most, the best works of art, works that all artists aspired to equal. But I think really by the time, I mean, they took a hundred of these antiquities from the Pope and it was part of Napoleon really moving the art capital of Europe from Rome to Paris. But by the time they actually got to Paris, um, that taste was starting to, to was, had passed and, and, uh, and the much more influential um, works were the paintings, the Venetian paintings. Isn't that interesting? Um, I want to talk with you a little bit about the Louvre, but I just want to remember, remind our listeners that they should be putting questions, because I'm sure you've got a million questions, into the Q&A box. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, you can click on Q&A and send us some good questions and we'll be to get into the questions in, in a few minutes. Um, but Cynthia, I wanted to ask you about the Louvre because of course we've been bringing it up again and again. And I think uh, all of us uh, imagine that the Louvre was what it was today, you know, had a pyramid in front of it and you paid $25 to get in. But of course it was a brand new institution with a, a fundamentally new model. So tell us about what the Louvre was and to the extent to which the people at the Louvre spurred Napoleon to do this plundering. Uh, well, it was fascinating because the Louvre, um, the Louvre had only, only three years before Napoleon's Italian campaign in 1793, under the reign of terror, the French, the revolutionaries had taken over the palace of the Bourbon Kings. They had turned part of it into a museum. They had stocked that museum with the collections of the French Kings. So um, as I said, it was, a, it was a symbol of democracy, a symbol of the French Republic and um, it, it was open to the public uh, much more than any other um, museum in Europe, even though there, uh, there were other, but the Vatican Museum was, was open, but usually the audience was really a very small group of elites, of the elite um, connoisseurs and artists who had to get a letter of introduction often to um, the museums in Vienna and in Germany. Um, but, so I think it, and what was so amazing is that it became such an influential model, this great public museum in the Palace of the French Kings, because it was such a dramatic symbol of um, the whole change in the political regime. And um, later, after Napoleon was defeated, that model was taken up by museums in Berlin, in Madrid, 
in London. Um, and, and it's the model that um, remains even today. Of course, that's the birth of museums as we understand them, right? Yeah, and every, every nation wanted their own national museum and that national museum had to have masterpieces of European art at its center. Which is of course what led uh, to Americans getting them as you, as you discussed in your other book about, about the American plunder of Europe, which was done a little less violently, I guess. A little less what? Violently. Yeah, it's a little less money, fun. with money, right? Money is <laughs> a problem. Um, uh, now I've forgotten, I was gonna ask you something about the Louvre. Um, oh, one of the things that what really uh, interested me is that the fact that they allowed, as you explain in the book, they allowed foreigners in on more days than they allowed locals in. It seems as though it was partly uh, an international uh, propaganda device, is that is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it, and, um, yeah, the, the artists also had some access, but that, that shows the political um, power of the art or the way they wanted to, Napoleon wanted to use it politically, that it was so easy for foreigners to, to have access to it much more than the French. Um, and later when, you know, when the Duke of Wellington and the allies um, defeated Napoleon at Waterloo and descended on Paris and and decided that the French king had to return all the works of art that Napoleon had stolen and put in the Louvre. Um, they didn't. They made that decision, but at first they were uns, unsure about it. They they wavered, and the reason that they did is they were worried that by taking removing these art these works of art from Paris, they were going to undermine the authority of the French king Louis the Eighteenth, whom they had just put on the throne. And I thought that also showed the incredible, the political power of that they had that they had used the art for, for in this political way. Did when the works got returned, did any of them end up in museums rather than their original settings? I mean, I don't know when the Academia in Venice was. It would have been later, of course. But was there was in a sense the Louvre model returned with any of the works? Is there any sense that people start considering these objects as portable objects when once upon a time they might have been in churches instead? Yes, um, and, and what's fascinating is, so the Academia in Venice was founded under, under the um, French, when under Napoleon. Um, and when that the other fantastic um, fe Veronese feast that, they that the French took, when it was returned to Venice, it didn't go back to the convent of Santi Giovanni e Paolo, it went to the academia where it is today. And another, they took, had taken, they took three Veronese feasts, a slightly smaller one, uh, went back not to Venice, but to the Brera in Milan. So, so they went from, they went, they went from Venice to Paris and then Paris to the Brera. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I didn't really know. How about in Rome? Did any of the antiquities end up in public display, more public display than they'd been in earlier. I mean, they'd been in the Vatican, a lot of them. Uh, did they go on display in any of the, the more civic spaces? They went, well, they were in the Vatican Museum, which was open to the public. And um, what was fascinating for me is when I had the list of the works of art that the French wanted in Rome. I mean, I, they had a list in Rome too. And I went to the Vatican Museum. Um, those works of art went back to exactly the same rooms from which they had been taken. And there's a, a famous sculpture courtyard with the Apollo Belvedere and the Leakawan. They, they went back. So um, that was a great, that was, you know, great fun to see. So you were able to trace a lot of these works. Did you try to visit as many of the works that had been plundered as you possibly could? Well, I really focused on Venice and Rome or else I'd still be doing a book. Right, <laughs> this is the danger of writing these kind of books is that you really wanna spend 20 or 30 years doing them because there's so much fun. Yeah, and also, and, and only about half of the works went back to Italy. And partly that was um, um, this Veronese, the French resisted sending them, sending everything back. And, and this, this one has a, had a, in particular, the, the, the reason it didn't go back is because the Austrians were then in charge of Venice. And 
So the Austrians, not the Venetians, had to retrieve the paintings for Venice. And when the Austrians came to the Louvre, um, they, and said, you have to pack up the paintings for Venice, the Louvre curator immediately wrote a, a letter um, saying, if you try to take this Veronese back, it's so too fragile, you will risk damaging it or maybe even destroying it. And that letter was sent to the Austrian emperor. Um, and he was in, he was in Paris, he, he, but he was leaving Paris that day and he made the decision that day. So he had no time to really consider. I'm sure he didn't want to risk destroying a masterpiece. Though Napoleon had been perfectly willing to risk destroying the masterpiece when he took it from Venice, with exactly the same excuse being proffered but ignored. Yes. You, right. Yes. Um, did any of the works end up in the market? Did any sort of slip out of public control and end up, you know, in private hands? Do you know, or did they all go back to some kind of state control? Uh, yeah, because these were all taken from, um, you know, the public collections or the state's collections, the collections of the princes and in the Duke of Parma, that kind of thing. No, I, I'm not that I'm aware of. So um, all ended sometimes up there are, are paintings, but they, they had, there are paintings that seem to have been taken during when Napoleon was plundering, but they weren't taken um, by, the, by, by the French government, you know, by, this, by those commissioners. They were taken by, seem to have been taken by generals or other people involved, you know, that were hanging around. So there was some literal plunder. I mean, when we think of plunder, we tend to think of a bunch of troops, you know, rampaging through a city and taking things. Was some, did some of that happen or did Napoleon have enough control over his troops to prevent that kind of, of plunder from happening, kind of, you know, out of control plunder? There was a lot of looting in the Italian campaign. He was always trying to stop it because he felt it was, you know, very destructive on all sorts of fronts and, and including the fact that he had lost control of his, of his troops. Um, but yes, it happened. So it made him look bad. He, the plunder had to all be done by him. Is that right? Yes, exactly right. He had to do the grand. Uh, and they had the French, a wonderful quote from the French government saying to, to, uh, or, or saying to the commission, take only masterpieces. If you plunder lesser works, it's not, you know, it's, it's vandalism. It's not right. really, Isn't that a nice it, distinction. Yeah. <laughs> Now, one of the things that I have to admit uh, that occurred to me in reading your book, you know, there's all of the praise for the for the Veronese, you know, it's clearly held up at that moment as truly one of the greatest works in the world. And I'm not going to debate whether it is or not. It obviously is. But it does strike me that Veronese's stature has dropped. I mean, you know, when I was studying Renaissance art history now 25 years ago, Veronese was seen obviously as a great artist, but didn't have anywhere near the stature he seemed to have had in the late 18th century, judging from your book. Do you have any thoughts on that change in his stature from one of the great masters to just a kind of secondary figure that he seems to be today? Well, I don't think of him today as a secondary figure. Uh, in, uh, I mean, yeah, the 18th, in the 18th century, they said this painting is all but the triumph of painting itself, which I have a hard time disagreeing with. And, um, but I think what happened was a lot of, and even some of the, you know, Ital uh, historians of Italian Renaissance art argued that his painting was too decorative, that it was too, um, it was too beautiful. And they really, it seems as they didn't understand, or they didn't bother to, um, or they didn't appreciate the intellectual structure behind his paintings. I mean, now there have been many Veramesi exhibitions re in, I guess the last 10 or 15 years or several major Veronese exhibitions. And it's so interesting because his, it's very, this painting is really complicated and it's, it, it, you know, it has more than one meaning and those meanings aren't that absolutely clear. Um, the theme of harmony with the musicians and there are lots of um, the biblical stories right there, the hourglass symbolizing my time is not yet come you know, that Jesus says to his mother. Yeah. And um, the, it, and so I think in recent years, they have people and that people have been analyzing the frescoes in the Villa Barbaro. And they, there's a great debate about what they mean because it's very complicated iconography. 
Right. Do you know if uh, who the source of the iconography was? Did he have a specific uh, scholar who was helping him? They think it's um, Daniel um, Barbaro, oh, yeah. who was a, a great humanist who had translated um, Palladio's treatises and who was also helped get him his first commission in help Veronese get his first major commission in Venice. Of course, he was a patrician as well, so he was well connected, Barbaro. Yes, exactly. Um, I think we should probably see about taking a few questions, shall we? Um, oh, this is a very interesting question from someone called Lauren Leroy. Uh, she says, what happened to the Veronese when the Nazis were confiscating art in Paris in World War II? Did they have an interest in the Veronese? Um, excellent question. Um, it's not clear whether they did or didn't because uh, the, the director of the Louvre had the Veronese in many paintings, hundreds of paintings, the best paintings removed from the Louvre. It was once again wrapped up and it was sent on a journey. First it went to the Chateau de Chambord and then it went to five other chateaus in Paris, I mean in France. Um, so it was, all those paintings were kept out of the Nazis' hands. I was wondering when I read that in your book, um, were they moved from chateau to chateau uh, as a kind of just to try to keep them more hidden or did they have to move? Could they have stayed in one chateau? Was that a strategy or was it just an accident of the way the, the war progressed? Um, it was a, it was a strategy. I mean, they they I think they they first wanted them on the Loire Valley to keep these paintings in the Loire Valley and chateau there. But then they realized, I think, once the Germans invade, you know, took Paris and and created the occupied zone in the north. Then they moved all those paintings to the south and kept them in um, the part of France that was under the Vichy regime. And sometimes, one time, you know, the, one of the paint, the um, it was a, they were in a Cistercian Abbey and it was too damp, and they had to move it for that reason, or they had, they had to move all the paintings for that reason. You know, reading in your book about the number of times the poor painting was rolled up, taken off the wall, and rolled up. It does make you think that he painted it awfully well, and the Venetians in general were pretty good craftspeople, but it does make you think that it's kind of miracle that this giant painting survived being rolled up and boxed up again and again. I, it, it terrifies me when I read about it. No, no, I think it's amazing. And, you know, the, one, what's wonder, one of the wonderful things is there's a contract. We have a contract for this painting, and the abbot of San Giorgio Maggiore insisted that Veronese use only the finest colors. Mm -hmm. um, including you know, ultramarine, which was the most expensive and beautiful blue made of powdered lapis lazuli. Um, but I think um, whenever I, when I spoke to conservators about Veronese, they always say, oh, he really used the finest materials. And that had a, has obviously a great influence on the future life of the painting. Of course, and for it, the fact that it lived at all, that it survived all of this. Let's just see what else do we have here. Um, uh, here, Brianna Seidel says, I'm curious what your thoughts are on colonialism and imperialism as they relate to stolen art and artifacts from colonies, and how many of those artifacts are still unreturned today. How do they relate to the power dynamics that you discuss in your book? That is, is the relationship between that kind of imperialism among European powers, I guess is the question, and the imperialism that involved taking things from you know, taking the Ben and Bronzes, etc. You see them as, as a similar set of issues? Well, I think about um, these, res these restitution issues are fascinating. I think this is, I, I don't think, I think many of them are very different. You know, I think of the Nazi plundering is very different from Napoleon's plundering and, and also with this, these colonial issues and they each have to be really um, taken on their own merits. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are there there can be very very different sets of issues, and of course the attitudes locally in Europe were complicated at that point because I don't think they completely moved on from from an old fashioned medieval notion that you simply conquered lands. I mean, it's one of the things that struck me in your book is that I think we really have mostly um, moved away from a notion that conquering another country is just in order to have their land is in any way a normal thing to do. Whereas I think under Napoleon, there still was a sense that that's how things happened in Europe. 
that a country grew by conquering and then might might retrench when that land was taken away again. But that seemed much more normal. There seemed to be much uh, many fewer moral issues involved in simple conquest than there are now. Um, it seemed to be that's... considered a normal part of politics. I think that's right. But what's so interesting is that when the Duke of Wellington, you know, and the Allies decided that they had to return all the art, he, the Duke of Wellington says that um, plundering is contrary to the practice of civilized warfare. And I think that's absolutely right. And that was basically the principle. But at the time, um, in terms of this restitution of Napoleonic works of, you know, of the art that Napoleon took, it wasn't the international law. You know, there, there since that plundering was not against international law. Um, it was only with the Hague, Hague Conventions of the first one is 1899. That Civilized warfare, that's got to be one of the great oxymorons of all time. <laughs> I think we're well, the Wellington. I think we're coming to the end. Uh, maybe one more question. Um, and this is a very interesting one, just a straightforwardly uh, factual one. Nicholas Mira asks, how did the three page letter of selections to be taken end up in the Venetian state archives? Is that where you found the letter um, listing what needed to be, be taken? Yes, isn't that interesting? And I loved it because there was an Italian um, copy made too of the letter. How did it, because they gave it to, they gave the list to the Venetians, you know, and asked them supply these pictures. And Pietro Edwards, um, the, the restorer who helped them, I think, I think that's why it ended up in the Venetian archives in, in his papers. We have almost no time left, but I have to ask you to tell our readers, or sorry, our listeners a little bit about Edwards, because he seems like such a fascinating figure, this kind of half English, half Italian character. Yeah, his, um, his parents were Catholics and they moved to Italy and they named him Pietro. Um, and he, he was fascinating because he, in this letter that he wrote, he, he, he write, he's elusive in a way too, because we have no idea of what he looked like. Even though he was a painter, there was no image of him. And he's very describing, he, he writes in this very flowery language about the French. And at the same time, at the, at, um, at the very end of his letter, where he's saying, he, he's really, he's writing this letter to record what happened. He wants everybody to know and how he, wants to argue that he did not make the selection of paintings. He helped the French pack them safely, but he didn't make the selection. And it's, um, and at the very end of the letter, he suggests to Venice that it should start its own museum based on the model of the Louvre. So once again, a very paradoxical situation. And he's writing in, in Italian, in Florida, Florida Italian? He writes in Italian. Right, right. Right, it's an maybe maybe a, a, a new book would be uh, is it is in order about Edwards because he seems like he seems also like an ancestor of of modern systematic uh, restoration conservation of pictures. He seems yes, because very serious he, about it. He um, pioneered this because he he insisted that everything he do to a picture he recorded everything he did that hadn't been done before, so that people would know if they put on new paint, touch up things, something with paint. And then he all every process, every procedure had to be reversible. That's also, you know, something that conservators do today. Extraordinary. Uh, is he a wildly well-known figure? I don't move in con conservation circles. Is he considered the father of modern conservation, or is he a little bit of a mystery for people? Do you have a sense of how famous he is? Very famous among conservators, and his his son became a conservator also. And there's something among conservators called the Pietro Edwards Society. Ah, so. okay. Well, there, I should start moving with among conservators to find these things out. Cynthia, I just want to thank you uh, and tell everyone what a fabulous book this is. Uh, a great read. It reads like a novel. Um, tons of fascinating stuff. I mean, how, how can you do better than having both Veronese and Napoleon in one book? You just can't ask for better than Paris and, and Venice. People should go to Paris and Venice now that we soon will be able to and just just trace the steps of Napoleon and Veronese uh, in those in those two cities. It's a fabulous book. And thank you, Cynthia, for a, a lovely, lovely thank hour. You, with you. Thank you so much, Blake. It was so much fun. Well, I think I, I speak for everyone when I say I wish we had another hour. What a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you, Cynthia Saltzman and Blake Gopnik for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone out there 
for coming as well. Uh, your patronage is what enables us to host wonderful talks like this, and we can't continue to, to, to do things like this without the book sales to support them. So as a gentle reminder, uh, the book link uh, to Plunder Napoleon's Theft of Veronese's Feast is in the chat. That'll take you to the Politics and Prose website where you can purchase the book and you can also visit the events page to find out what's coming up next. We hope to see you soon. In the meantime, stay well, everyone, and stay well read. Thank you again to both of you. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Politics and Prose. Thanks, Cynthia. Bye. Cheers.